So today, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Lynx McLean and Mr. Simon Manda, who will be part of this discussion. And it's entitled Silenced and Other Breaking from the Periphery. So our first speaker, Dr. Lynx McLean, um, will present or proposes a critical intersectional feminist approach that is informed by four pillars, which are standpoint theory, intersectionality, reflexivity, and feminist ethics of care, which could serve to do the work of decolonizing the curriculum in a meaningful and participatory manner. Um, okay, so I was thinking about whether I wanted to propose something um, when I saw the call for presentations we put around. And I realized that the project I've been working on last year and that was published this year, which was a meta research project on feminist internet research, um, could be really helpful uh, just because it's come up in conversations with other groups. Um, now, this meta research project essentially studied feminist internet research and looked at their methodology and the ethical frameworks. And we realized that there were these four pillars that were emerging, um, either in their thinking or in their actual planning of their projects. Um, and I was involved in Brokart's and students and also in my time at CPUT, um, just started to realize that I needed to think about a different way of teaching um, that wasn't kind of what I'd experienced at Rhodes in my first year, you know, that, that kind of approach with it needed to be more collaborative, um, informed by Paulo Freire and Bell Hooks, for instance, and really thinking about the student being in conversation with the lecturer, in conversation with the institution, and to collaborate on knowledge production, but also collaborate on uh, how they were assessed or what they wanted to learn. So I always try to keep my, my curriculum as open as possible. I knew what I wanted to teach, but we would have a first week where like, what are the issues that are burning for you right now? How do you feel about this structure that I'm proposing? And it seems kind of messy, and it is, because if you're not ready for it, and if you're not feeling confident about it, it can just be overwhelming. But I've noticed that those were the classes or subjects that I really enjoy teaching. Um, and the students really enjoy having that kind of freedom to really determine their own learning. Um, so what I'm proposing here is that we think about those four pillars in terms of journalism curriculum. Can I get the next slide, please? Um, <clears throat> so critical intersectional feminism. Most folks hear feminism and they panic at the discam. Totally get it. There is some bad rep out there. But for me, ultimately, feminism is about power and understanding how power plays out, the kind of roles that exist, um, the kind of privileges people have, and how those interlock or interweave or pull at each other. Um, and so I like critical intersectional feminism because it, it speaks to different experiences, how they exacerbate each other, that kind of interlocking that you'll see in, in South Africa, primarily you'll see it around race and class and gender. Those are the three that really happen there. Um, so I do like it. And I do think it's it's important to think about feminism not only in the gendered sense, but to think about it as power and how power plays out. I get the next slide. So the four pillars that came out of this research were standpoint theory, intersectionality, reflexivity, and then feminist ethics of care. So I think, do you mind if I get the next slide, please? Oh wait, ah, I'm jumping ahead. Scroll back. Um, <laughs> sorry. Actually, yeah. So these four pillars came out of understanding where people were positioned. So we were working with marginalized groups and how they were generating knowledge. Um, and then we were trying to figure out what was happening. So they couldn't separate parts of themselves. So they were looking at gendered relations. They're like, well, we can't separate race from this, especially the team in, in Brazil. Um, and then talking to them and trying to understand how they were doing this work and trying to in, like interrogate their own um, interlocking, I don't want to use intersectionality so much, but how they interlock with the power that was meeting their participants. And so reflexivity was coming out of that as well. And then ethics of care, <clears throat> which was the most fascinating for me, because it wasn't just traditional research ethics of ticking a box and this is how we do it and what we need to do in order for the research to happen and the, the ethics protects the, <clears throat> the research, in fact, not really the participant. There's ethics of care, speaks about ethics being part of the process. 
And so it is about the research team, whether they're exp experiencing vicarious trauma, that's something that came out, um, or if it's about, you know, how students are feeling in the moment, uh, are they, are they feeling, you know, people take issue with the word triggered, but are they feeling triggered? What is it about that? And not just going, oh, are you feeling triggered? Let's, let's remove you from the space, get you counseling, but it's also thinking about it in a productive way. What is it that is triggering? How can new knowledge be formed from this? How can we improve? And that's where reflexivity comes back in intersectionality. And you've got this beautiful cycle that can happen. Um, thank you. So from that, there were also these other things happening. So participatory design, community-based research, messiness and discomfort. And I'll speak to them a bit more, but the messiness and the discomfort for me are the most interesting. It was this, this idea that there was no clean and clear way to do the research. And I think there is no clean and clear way to restructure curriculums, think about how we do this in a way that is productive, is socially just, is participatory, um, is community-based, you know, for instance, the growing months experience. It's going to be messy. And it has been messy. I mean, I, I sit and observe how the messiness done from the outside slightly. Um, and then discomfort, and discomfort as something that is productive. So I'm giving away some, no, I will talk to it just now. I was getting really excited. I wanted to just go into it. Um, can you next slide, please? So standpoint theory, just a kind of summary, is it's this idea of being, your knowledge is where you are positioned in the world as a person. Um, but it's it's about not just essentializing, it's also about thinking around the unique knowledge that you experience as somebody who experiences oppression and discrimination and how you manage that and what knowledge you're producing from it. And I think there's something really interesting there if we think about our students, but also our lecturers and their positions in the world and how those positions come with the knowledge base. And we haven't yet necessarily given it space as its own body of theory. Um, Bell Hooks does really great work there in terms of, I think it's teaching community, and this always happens when I try and remember a book. It's like I've never read a book in my life before. Um, but really interesting stuff. What, what comes into came out of her classroom from the students and their lived experiences. And she made that knowledge that was accessible. Um, and then, yeah, power and privilege and identity and roles. And I'll speak to that a bit more. Um, but yeah, it's just asking that as lecturers, but also students, we think about positions we have in the world. Thank you. So, already spoke a bit about intersectionality. It's about how our identity, aspects of our identity, interlock, intersect, exacerbate. Um, <clears throat> so, we can't just assume that a student or even a lecturer entering the classroom is just a student. There's somebody coming in with lived experiences, um, with traumas. Um, you know, if I just use my own example, I'm a trans non-binary queer person, and that informs the work I do. That informs how I observe gender, how I think about gendered relations. You know, if somebody asks me to make them coffee, my brain goes, oh, whoa, hang on, gendered relation happening here, this person is positioning me in a particular way. And it may have been a simple thing, but because I am plugged into that position, I'm immediately thinking about these things. So there is this thing happening, and I think there is potential there if we, it is difficult, but sometimes we don't want students to, we don't want to trigger students. But there is a way, let me rather say, there is a, we should think of the way to create space for this. Um, and I want to propose, because I think each classroom will have its own experience and each lecturer will want to do things their own way. Um, but yeah, it's about thinking about how power plays out. And power can be thought of in such an ugly way. But it's also about an exchange that is happening and just think of it as, as something, again, productive. It doesn't have to be violent. The risk here, again, with uh, intersectionality as a standpoint is essentializing and just to think then critically about, about what you're doing, about not making assumptions, about getting, about making space for the complex um, and the layered. Thanks. Uh, reflexivity is not reflection. Reflection is the pathway to reflexivity um, people often think if they write in a journal and they go, I have this feeling about this thing I did, that's the work done. Reflexivity is really about critically thinking about your positionality. Um, we've seen, for instance, I'm witnessing and am in conversation with um, issues around whiteness, for instance, 
in the school and I mean in the previous spaces I've worked in and what does that mean to to unpack whiteness am I just going oh I'm not a racist or am I going I'm doing anti-racist work but am I willing to get uncomfortable with my identity am I willing to ask students what it is about my body that they're faced with not me but what I represent and what is it about this that makes them uncomfortable? How can we create a space where they're comfortable and also where I'm comfortable and how, how do we think of it? But it does take a kind of resilience to be able to expose yourself in that way, to be vulnerable. And I think that's also about the kind of academic project you have and the kind of academic project you are, actually. Um, and discomfort came up, so I was getting ahead of myself earlier and I'm going to talk a bit more. But discomfort really is an interesting thing for me at the moment. Um, yeah, I think as soon as you have that like little blip of, oh, I'm uncomfortable or, oh, that's defensiveness rising up. I think that's the moment where you pause and you go, okay, what is it about this that's making me uncomfortable? You know, you see folks being very quick to say, we're going to decolonize, but, you know, adding a few authors is not decolonization. It's, it's getting into the, into the discomfort. Um, and it's something that needs to be managed because we, we're coming with our own lived experiences, our own biases, and we need to actually understand what's happening. And it's got to be dealt, like it's not dealt with, held in a very careful, engaging way, but not a way that continues to give power to those who already have a stack of people. Um, thank you. So yeah, and then feminist ethics of care, as I've spoken, it's not just the ticking a box approach, um, but you know, it's, it's like asking difficult questions. What about my classroom environment? You know, and asking students for that input. What about the way I do things is violent? What authors would you like to see here? Would you like to talk about the bibliography or the prescribed reading list? You know, creating that space. Um, and also negotiating the space, you know. So is it important that we continue with the curriculum? Or do you want to have one day out of the semester where we just talk about difficult things in your life and try and bring it back and or try and generate knowledge from that. There is potential there, but it, it, you've got to be willing to, to get messy. Um, yeah, and then just safety, I think is important as well. So ethics of care <clears throat> speaks about safety. It's not just physical safety, but it is, you know, mental health, the emotions, the, the psyche, just making sure that spaces are safe, but they're not, not doing the work. You can have safe and discomfort at the same time. Uh, next slide. So messiness, it's currently one of my favorite things, really, like I'm loving it so much. Um, so out of the research that I was doing, what emerged was that people were trying to hide the messiness. They were really trying to get rid of it. I was trying to get rid of it in that project because that meta research is not something that is done often because it is very messy you can't tell the difference between literature theoretical framework methodology especially if you're doing research on research um and research on ethics because then you're like is this my ethics there it, and now if you read the report it looks fantastic it's like 54 pages or something it was 200 pages and it was messy and there were like 20 things i'm already but um yeah but messiness can be productive um, and I think there is a way to do it if we are open about the messiness. So, you know, if the school, for like use the drone school, for instance, um, if it were to start on a true decolonization process, um, being transparent about it, saying, you know, these are the difficult conversations we're having and not, and not doing a PR exercise, but doing the, this is difficult, this is horrible. This is how many humans resigned or how many students ran away, or these are the arguments we've been having. That shows that, 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 that's the reality. It's not your Instagram version of it, you know. Um, yeah, again, productive, transformative. For me, I think there is something there about just, I mean, it does require commitment. Like, you've got to really want to get into it. Um, it's not something you can be like, oh, I'm going to schedule an hour for it today. It's, it is messy, messy work. It's emotional work. It can, people can feel hurt on both, on all sides, not both sides, there are many sides here. Um, but I think it's absolutely necessary. Sorry. Um, is that the, yeah, so reflexivity, creating a network of support. So again, ethics of care comes in there. 
and um, that that was a, that's what I was speaking to about the embracing messiness is care. So sharing with others that this is your journey, so that they don't feel so like isolated or alone. Um, I presented my research at the start of the year to the new intake of feminist internet researchers. And it was incredible. This is the messiness is what they resonated with. So it's like, this is, this makes sense. Um, and we didn't realize that it was a problem, like that it wasn't a problem that our participants weren't signing up with. I'm currently going through it with participants where they're scheduled for an interview and they don't show up. And I go, oh, this is part of the mess, write about it, it's fine. And just kind of go, knowledge is being produced here, like <laughs> just allowing that to happen. Next slide, please. So I was chatting on um, discomfort. I've already said some of these things. So next slide, please. Um, yeah, so it's just about, oh wait, can you go back, sorry. Um, I was talking about messiness in my head and then, yeah, so it, it's just about the discomfort. I, I think I have touched on this, but it is this idea of just making space for things to be uncomfortable. Um, it's not like you're going to have fire ants walking all over you. You know, you can create a system and a structure where you go, okay, we're going to do some uncomfortable work, but then you you create it in a way. So you workshop it. Workshopping is often the best way. You workshop it so that there's something afterwards where you can be debriefed, do something light and fun. I mean, it doesn't always have to be really awful. Um, sometimes it can be individual discomfort. So journal by yourself, think about the stuff. If you're willing to share, you know, you can structure it in a way where it's contained, but the messiness, you know, and discomfort, they, they go very well together. Um, last slide, please. So, yeah, it's for me, it's about doing careful work, so careful work, um, and leaning into what is difficult. And I think that's where we should be thinking, um, in terms of how we think about the curriculum, how we think about our classrooms. Um, how we think about the research we want to do, uh, our interactions with our colleagues. I think that being open to that um, does create the space for something different. And it's not just surface level transformation, then uh, it can be true deep work. And unfortunately, it is painful work. Um, but if you put the right systems in place, it can be productive work. That's it. So I'm going to stop talking and speaking to that um, decolonizing because I think we tend to be comfortable with what we know, you know. So I think trying to change systems means that we have to be uncomfortable and everybody is uncomfortable. So thank you so much for that. Um, then the next speaker is Mr. Simon Banda. So I'm just trying to get the, oh, here it is. Okay, so he is going to speak about media and disability uh, representation moving towards a new normal, but which normal? So it's a call for um, an increase in disability representation in the media. Thank you. Thanks for those introductions. Okay, Lisa Bowman. Um, disability is a social construct. You know, all our wisdom, we try to play with words in terms of writing stories. With uh, uh, I've heard terms like different, uh, differently abled, uh, abled, uh, wheelchair bound, you know, the issue of language um, in writing narratives that concerns people with disabilities. But the guiding principle, just like any um uh, journalism handbook of how to use the correct uh, language and when it comes to disability people actually don't uh conform to those standards uh the guiding principle in writing about disability because it's a human rights issue uh is the united nations uh, convention on the rights of persons with disabilities this convention came about after the world war ii um after the World War II, there was so much uh, that happened in the world in terms of people getting hurt, limbs, you know, amputations, uh, uh, PSTDs, and all. And society took it upon itself to place people who had these issues into homes and take care of them. Uh, as a result, uh, people in homes doing nothing, just waking up, eating, drinking, and sleeping. 
uh, there was a lot of uh, suicide or thoughts, and there was a lot of uh, uh, problems that came as a result. The United Nations came together and put out a human rights convention, which is the UNCRPD. Uh, 188 countries have ratified, including South Africa, and there are 50 articles that talk to human rights. And these are embedded into the constitution of those countries that have ratified. And among other things is the issue of uh, employment, self-representation, um, and a whole lot of uh, other things that talk to emergence uh, in terms of if there's a COVID pandemic, what happens? Uh, so I'm just going to use the social construct from this point where disablement is in, in a social construct where certain barriers prevent uh, access to social economic platforms. So on the right, I'm, I'm gonna use an educational uh, setup as an example. Uh, below the ages of five, there's no census. We don't have figures, high mortality and all that. Uh, but when it comes to four to six, early childhood intervention, um, uh, crash, grid R, that's when people start noticing that, oh, a kid is a, a situation or there's an issue. Uh, mostly black communities, you have issues of hiding children away from the mainstream because uh, of stigmas, uh, witchcraft issues, or just traditional beliefs, even religious beliefs. Uh, so you don't have much of the children get intervention until a, late, a later stage. When it gets to uh, an age of, uh, let's say, 10 to 12 years old, uh, there's special education needs centers and vocational uh, curriculum that you can opt for, depending on ability. Uh, and as you can see, as we go up, uh, the narrow it, it becomes. On, uh, there's a very low metric pass rate in these um, uh, uh, centers uh, for special education needs because of lack of capacitation, either the teaching staff or the capacity of the, uh, of the students themselves. As we go up to the tertiary because of lending, lack of funding, lack of access, accommodation refers to the access part of things. Um, Rhodes University is an old varsity. Access in terms of mobility is an issue to some people. So by virtue of that, a person might not even consider coming here and go to another university. There, there's a finite number of PhD holders with disabilities in the country, and it's a fact. And everywhere else, especially in the sub-Saharan uh, uh, context. So the barriers that are mostly uh, disabling factors is a social construct, because the medical looked at how hurt a person was, and they looked at an impairment and they put disability on it. But then we had to move for social economic interventions for people with disabilities to function. You need to identify what is limiting them to go to the mainstream, which are the above um, barriers. The people's attitudes, like I said, stigmas, and how people view disability in general. Communication. Um, deaf people can't use the medium of radio and vice versa. Um, there are people that can't access um, uh, the mainstream news uh, in terms of print because they can't see. So communication becomes an important. The use of sign language, uh, uh, South African sign language, the use of other alternative methods of communication. We'll look at uh, the solutions in the next slide. Uh, physical access, like I said, uh, more for mobility, uh, for the first thing I asked the, when we came here, said, how do we get to the second floor if I'm a wheelchair user or a can stick user? And so, oh, there's a lift, but it bent a couple of days ago, so it's not functional. Mm -hmm. Then that person has to travel all the way 
It'll only be limited when they downstairs, which is a pity. Um, policy. Policy can be there or cannot be there. It's either here or there. It can be there, the policy, or it, at times it's not even provisioned for, and at times it becomes a barrier because of the way it's structured. Programmatic is how things work, how uh, our cell phones work, how our uh, uh, laptops work. Um, if you look at your laptop right now, Colin, uh, the home keys, gee? The home keys, they've got a touch them like this. What's the? Yes. There's a reason for that. So it's accommodation. And these are things that we take for granted because for us, it doesn't really matter. So from the home, home keys, it, it, a person who's visually impaired can navigate even in the dark and type a letter. You see, it's provision. Those are solutions to some of these bar barriers. Social barriers together with physical, you might not find 10 people on wheelchairs in a rugby match. Why? There's no space for them to, to navigate. And then transportation, which is the biggest, biggest of all issues, especially to those that are on the SASA uh, grant system. Uh, they tend to pay twice in a taxi, which is very ironic because they pay for the chair, space and for themselves yet are the lowest earner so it's a very sad state of affairs this is where disablement comes and next slide please we're going to look at some of the solutions that the world of disruption has brought about audio description maybe we started hearing it when netflix came and all like oh ad ad uh, to those that are not aware um audio description gives sight to the blind. A live cricket match, audio description describes the atmosphere around the stadium, more uh, in addition to the commentary that's given. So in movies, between dialogue and music, audio description becomes a very big tool. So deaf, uh, blind people can now experience a movie because they now also can understand what's happening in terms of color and other uh, elements that used to miss. Closed captioning versus subtitles. Closed captioning is on call. Any language is interchangeable and it describes even the wind or those sounds by being written so that a deaf person can understand. There's a reason why greening is important in new buildings like this, where you've got a uh, lighting system, exits uh, thing, because deaf people, uh, they see more than they don't hear. So this becomes very important. Subtitles are made into a uh, thing in a certain language, but they are not interchangeable. So closed caption becomes a better option. Then we can go to screen readers for the visual impaired, uh, where protocols like JAWS uh, and um, Dolphin uh, help uh, visual impaired. Now our phones uh, on accessibility, whether it's an Android or uh, iPhone, we have all that at our discretion, but it's for people with special needs. Uh, voice to text, another way of using um, when, when you don't, when you can't see, you just uh, say something and it's printed either into Braille or into mainstream text. Augmentative and alternative communication for those that are on the social spectrum and they are non-verbal. They can either communicate with a pet that has digital uh, thing, um, digital interface, or their thoughts can be communicated into voice. Steve Hawkins used to think his thoughts would be conveyed on, uh, electronically, that's AAC. That's the technology that was used. Then we talk about cochlear implants for deaf people, which is a, um, an intervention where they actually bridge uh, physically, the ear and the brain. Um, cute speech, which is too controversial to print to sign language users. Uh, cute speech is basically sign language followed by 
pronouncing the words and talking. There's a difference between part and tat. But when I'm speaking and the lip reader is looking at me, they can't tell the difference. Then sign language follows, cute speech. But it's still a very, very controversial area because there's a lot of politics in the in the uh, hearing impaired uh, thing um, uh, society because they they have also a structure of um, uh, internal or the, the original people that can use the language. Uh, we we'll talk about that when I talk about Coda, the movie that uh, won an Oscar award. Um, South African Sign Language is now officially the 12th language, and it's a medium of uh, teaching in um, hearing impaired schools. I'm going to give an example of a school that have attained a 100% metric pass rate for the past 10 years. Um, they know about accessibility, e accessibility, where you can either um, change how a website look by virtue of the needs that you have uh, uh, for you to access that website. Uh, next, next one. Okay, in 2010, we came up with an idea of starting a newspaper that focused on narratives that talk to disability because it was an upper the viewpoint or a superheroism viewpoint. And in between the initiatives that aimed to mainstream people with disabilities were at like the back of everyone. There was a lot of alienation. And one of my friends, a writer, Musa Izudu, wrote a book, Who's on the Soles of My Shoes. He's on a wheelchair and he, um, he didn't coin the word, but he further explained what it meant. Um, disability from a position of enablement. Next, I'm going to rush through to a uh, few seconds. So uh, sometime in 2015, we were approached by Media24 and said, we can't house you inside, but what can we do to help? Obviously, they wanted their PE score to go high, but this was a win-win situation. And the colonial master became an ally. So we <laughs> said, no, it doesn't matter. So they uh, give us an opportunity to train 10 youth with disabilities every year. Basic journalism to raise voices in across the country. Uh, it's an amazing program. This was the launch 2015, two years later. Next. Uh, they put it in the integrated annual report. They, it was uh, I saw AIP and also ran a training and internship program for black journalists with disabilities in partnership with an NGO, which is Disability Next. But we continued from the 2015, we still are working with them every year. We've changed the number, the number of students to 10 for phase one. Phase two has got um, uh, about six students. Then we go to phase three, which is like five students. Uh, next. Uh, I wanted to play a video, but with the minutes that are there now, maybe let's not play that uh, next. Okay, phase one. Uh, for one story a month in home study, we don't, it's not a physical program, it's online. We pay them a, 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 renewal, a, a, a stipend of 5,000 and give them a tablet for access. Um, we've had 40 beneficiaries since the program started. Phase two, it goes to 7.5. I'm putting figures here for you to relate it to a grant. The difference between a grant and what we offer them. And for 5,000 a month for somebody who's in the less than a thousand for a grant, it really means a lot. The requirement is one story a month. On the second phase is PR and business formulation. And on the third phase is mainly how to run your uh, own program or your, your own business in PR. So that's the exit strategy. But in between, some of the students get to finish their degrees get to be absorbed into the employment world, then it becomes a win-win for them. Next. Uh, some of the hidden stories, let's, let's go now, we're gonna be flipping through. Quatindua uh, School for the Deaf, they have been achieving 100% metric pass rate uh, for the past 11 years. And it's, it's a school for the deaf and they do a mainstream uh, metric curriculum. Uh, next. 
Uh, Prudence Mabela won an Oscar Award 2010, uh, a documentary uh, music by Prudence. She's Zimbabwean. And it's a story that a lot of us misses. That's why I said hidden stories. We miss these stories because they have something to do with disability. Uh, she was in the awards. That was the producer. Next. Yes, she was on the red carpet with Oprah Winfrey. She's based in Zimbabwe, but she also comes here. She was a casual day ambassador uh, in South Africa. Next, this is the youngest um, uh, recipient of the International Children's Peace Prize. It's a Nobel Peace Prize for kids. She's based in Cape Town. These are her achievements. It's a story, I'm just going through them as you can read. Uh, Kelly Mycroft, uh, she's done a master's uh, in policy at UCT, and she continues advocating for uh, children with disabilities. Next, there she is with a uh, former de uh, min uh, declared because it's also a recipient. Can I, can I just finish that? Do you mind if we cut into the questions and answers then? Yeah. All right. South Africa is the first uh, deaf teacher or the only deaf teacher who has got Down syndrome in the whole world. And that's Sherry McBride. She is an international ambassador of persons with uh, Down syndrome, and she advocates for adults with uh, Down syndrome. Uh, and she's made a mic on the world stage. Next, Natin Gubani, 2010, when he started the paper, this kid was in grade nine. He approached us and said, Can I be your cartoonist? He was a student, he was at Open A in Durban. And then he did the thing with us for about a year. Then he went on to start uh, study graphic design, and then he became the chief cartoonist for the Soweton, I think the Soweton. And recently, bought he wrote a book that was endorsed by the Department of Health on COVID. Let me go next. Tandy Newton retweeted about the book, and Zolim Kizer put uh, the book as the official government um, uh, communication tool for the whole country. It's been uh, translated into Tosa English, uh, other languages, and is including uh, Swahili as well. Next, Ayn Wagner is an adventurer. He's blind, profound, blind. Just look at what he has achieved in terms of things that he challenged himself to do, including having the, uh, the highest land driving speed uh, in Africa. There's a video on YouTube. It shows you how he did it. So he's done a lot of, 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 of things. Next. All right, uh, Zukinzo, she's on a wheelchair. She's a wheelchair user. She's also a Yali. Yali is Young uh, American uh, Leadership Initiative, also called the uh, Obama Fellowship. Uh, she's doing a PhD in public policy in Tokyo. And she was recently featured in uh, Tito Jackson's video uh, showcasing diversity in terms of disability. Uh, she sits on a number of boards and she served as a South African presidential working group uh, member on disability. Uh, next. Okay, I needed to play that video, the second one, the Edin Dopo, please. That's that's the capping one. There it's on the camera. Yes. You know, I often say that what makes a space accessible isn't a ramp, right? There's a ramp behind you, which I love. Thank you for the ramp. Uh, but a ramp doesn't make a space accessible. It provides entry into a building. What makes a space accessible is how all of us, regardless of ability, regardless of identity, are able to come together and feel validated and have access to agency, self-actualization, and really feel dignified, right? So it's not we're not going to get to intersectionality through compliance or through ticking a box, but it is going to be about celebrating the magic and the beauty of all of the multiplicity of identities that we embody at the same time. Um, I feel so incredibly honored to be all of those identities. I wouldn't want to be anything else. Um, and I think it really is about validating and celebrating our humanity. This the last uh, on the 
this this uh, Ed posted this on the 22nd of uh, on the 4th of August. Uh, for the first time since 2001, a majority of the world's population lives under non-democratic rights violating governments. The UN High Commissioner for Human Rights plays a crucial role in times like this. And the next one should be a young black gay wheelchair user. Then he says, I'm publicly announcing my bid to be the next United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. If selected, I'll be the highest ranking international civil servant with a disability since the UN was founded in 1945. This will be a historic victory for the 1.3 billion disabled people who, according to the UN, comprise the world's largest uh, minority group. My platform to bring fresh thinking, new energy and inspiration to the Office of the High Commission of the Human Rights. And in Dope is South African. Yes, so you see so many number of what, including the standard, uh, the Millennium uh, Development Goals. Yes, he's, he's one of the ambassadors. So guys, this is inclusion when there's access and mainstreaming. That was my topic, thank you. Thank you so much. Very interesting. And yeah, I really like it, especially once the, the last, uh, the video said validating and celebrating our humanity, irrespective of um, whether it's a disability, whether it's about race, gender, etc. And I think one of the points that you made was about the policymakers and how there are policies in place, but you know, sometimes there's no provision for it. Mm -hmm. So people sit up there and they make all these policy decisions, yet the ones who have to implement implement them, uh, you know, they're not provisioned for. So I think that also goes to, you know, everything that we're talking about with the dis um, with the decolonializing the curriculum. So thank you very much to our speakers. Um, if we are still keeping to the hour, we have 15 minutes for questions. So does anyone have questions for the speaker? <laughs> yes. So just you were saying there about policy, which I find really important and it, it speaks to, to what Simon's going to what I spoke to it's about who's present in the shaping of policy and who's present in the shaping of the curriculum you know if we're presenting our curriculum policy is changing in this instance you can do that because often things are written by people who don't necessarily understand the needs of others or we are not seeing diversity and inclusivity in that um you know I'm just trying to think of an example right now so an example of the work I'm currently doing is on gender-based violence, and I'm trying to expand the definition of gender-based violence to be far more inclusive. So currently we only understand this as gender woman, and I'm working on transgender, non-binary, and gender diverse understandings of online gender-based violence. And we're currently doing a big push to change the definition um, and to include things such as dead naming and misgendering, because that is violence based on someone's gender. Um, and the kind of violence that people experience in online online spaces. But we can't make that push without the voices of trans, non-binary, gender diverse people. Um, it's one thing for somebody to say, sure, this is what we need, but actually speak to folks. Um, it's stuff like the systems, the reporting mechanisms. If you've got a person on the other side who's processing the reports, who doesn't have any understanding of the lived experience, they're going to dismiss or not, they may not necessarily dismiss, but often those experiences are dismissed because they're, they're not with the majority. So I think inclusivity um, and, and as many voices as possible and participatory design, collaborative design, that's the way it's bringing about transformation. So, so. There's a motto in disability that says nothing about us without us. Uh, I think it's been adopted by many marginalized um, uh, groups. And it it's only points to self-representation. If somebody does it, then if they, don't, they don't do justice. We're talking earlier about in the media or film uh, that have won uh, awards uh, by depicting people with disabilities. And they are honored for doing it as an act. Whereas if we look at a film like CODA, CODA is C-O-D-A. It means children of deaf adults. There is a community of, of young adults that are 
verbal, but their first language is sign language. Those are coders. There's a movie that was made, and for the first time, uh, the lead character was a male uh, deaf guy. Uh, last year, they got an Oscar for that position. And, and this is becoming a norm of self-representation in a lot of movies. Um, there's another one with Down syndrome, the peanut butter something. Uh, sorry, I've forgotten the name. There's a new one with the autistic drama. Um, yes, what's it called? I used to be famous or something on Netflix. And also, the, the, there's a lot of series coming up now, and it's good to see that Netflix and and the, and the big uh, streaming uh, giants are beginning to realize that that self representation means something. So yeah, the movement is taking charge, and we really appreciate. It. Are there any questions from the floor? Um. God, I'm going to say it. It's more of a comment than a question. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, Simon, we were talking earlier about invisible disability, and I was glad to hear Nick's mention autism there. And it is very good to see um, the representation in the media being um, to see to see people who are autistic representing themselves in the media and not just in um, films or, or in acting, but also in documentary settings um, where, where people are not required to mask. They're allowed to just be. And that's, I think, is, is very important and often something that gets missed in um, recognizing disability in university spaces or institutional spaces. Um, and it can be particularly harmful because masking for a long period or having to mask um, extensively, uh, it can, can mean that you're, as an autistic person, your stress levels go through the roof and you might not be able to get across your thoughts or to contribute the way you might wish to contribute in that. So. Thank you for, for bringing that up as well, as being something that should be considered uh, as, as an invisible disability. So thank you for our discussion earlier and for mentioning that, thanks. And there, was a, there was a lot to mention, it's just that the time is a factor. Also looking at uh, invisibility and visible, uh, just like the words visible, you see it, invisible, you can't. You, there's a lot of us here who might have issues, uh, but some, they prefer to keep quiet about it. And it becomes a problem for the next person because now you need to, the accommodation of that, how does it work out? How do you make a policy in a workspace, in an environment? And, and less, more or less, like, how do we write about narratives like that? How do we even start looking at uh, raising awareness of such are uh, invisible disabilities. I think this comes back to, to what Nick was talking about, the productivity of, of discomfort and messiness. I mean, as someone, as a 54-year-old white male, starting to engage with gender and trans people, and this is very new to me, actually. Mm -hmm. and, and I stand the chance of putting my foot in it and being offensive mm -hmm. at any point out with all the best intentions of the world. Um, and and in every same sector of intersectionality, we face those those problems, that, that, that potential actually. You know, it may not just gender or disability, race, whatever it is. There's a potential for people to. It is messy. Will be messy. Um, and the it's in that discomfort that we arrive at a at a conclusion. You know, at, at a realization and learning and that that there is the productivity that you that you're talking about. You might be wondering, in your case, like we were saying, discomfort. We were saying earlier with uh, help. A rich, every rich family that is achieved uh, in societal standards, they have a child with autism. They're not, they're very much in denial. They won't tell the world about it because for them, it's not that perfect uh, setup. And there's a lot of those cases that are bringing up in this modern time. So discomfort, yeah. So yeah, what, what you're speaking to me is very important. You know, in some of the training I do, sometimes I do training on like how to make classrooms more inclusive, especially LGBTIQ. 
um, and all students are going to go into industry. So often the emergency service students at CPC are help. Um, so do the pronouns, all, all that stuff. And I kind of I just go up front. I'm like, you're allowed to stuff up. Go ahead. But I advocate for kind curiosity. So if you don't understand something, as long as you're coming up with kindness and you go, I don't understand this. I don't mean any harm, but I'm going to ask you the question. And, but at the same time, to bear in mind, there's some people like most days I'm up to the emotional labor, you know, mm -hmm. and but there are other people who aren't up to it. But it is the work I do. So I, I'm totally cool with it. But I think it's also about so that discomfort and being able to sit with it. But you, people get really like squirmy. It's at an ethnographic level, it's really fascinating for me. But it's, you know, that kind of just going, this is okay. And I think, you know, if we're going to look at the classroom, for instance, it's about saying, all right, it's going to be an uncomfortable space, but we're going to operate with these are our, oh, this is really cool. I will look for it. But there's really cool basic standards for having a good, inclusive, safe conversations. I'll find them somewhere. I should include them. Um, and just going kindness first and people can say i'm sorry i'm not comfortable and knowing that that's not theirs to carry to carry your comfort you know and it's again it's messy but if, if it's facilitated and held well then it can be really incredible generation of a new space to agree with next and say how important that is not just in university age classes or university classes that have schools um, for both the teachers and the learners. How valuable, I, I know you've done some workshops next and how valuable it is at school level to have somebody come in and just talk openly about the intersections of gender, sexuality and um, and neurodivergence, because um, neurodivergence often incorporates fluidity in all senses. And every school that's had somebody come in and talk to them has reported an increase in kindness. But the, the kids have been kinder to each other. And that's been very lovely to hear. I think, I think that level um, is also important to address. And I just wonder in the current society, in, the society, in our current society, because I'm, I'm, I believe in the need to have a kind of space. But what if people don't want to find? What if we are in a space where we bring important ideas and people just feel like this is. It's not critical enough, or, or, you know, because I mean, you could say people don't be kind, but I mean, it's people to at least need to have dignity and to respect someone else's dignity, and even that's not happening. So, I guess the challenging question is in the spaces we have now, um, if people do not respect basic dignity, which is a lot of what we're, and I mean, a lot, what I felt like was a synergy between the presentation is just recognizing the dignity of others um, and operating from that space, you know? Um, how do we kind of deal with those spaces? And, and is it a factor or is it a non-factor? Yeah. I think recognizing where people are at their journey, so the journeys aren't linear. Sometimes people are ready to have the conversation, sometimes they aren't. And you can't force those conversations because sometimes you might have greater resistance but sometimes people just need a little bit of a and then leave them to sit with themselves and hopefully and that's for me where reflexivity comes in so you know sometimes you have to do that journey with alone um and i, I like the idea of call in culture versus call out culture so just because somebody's not ready to have that conversation doesn't mean you have to call them out I think we should then call in people who are ready or connect the person who's not ready with somebody else at their level, you know. Because um, again, I'm just thinking about the labor. Sometimes you don't want to make people take on additional labor of trying to get somebody ready when they're just not. Um, so being open to the fact that people are in different parts.
Yeah. So I mean, if it's in the classroom context, I think it's what's stating that this is a safe space and how do we make the space safe <coughs> together, for instance. Um, and that includes kind of going, if you're not ready to have a conversation, okay, can you sit with it or can you have a conversation with me as a lecturer? Um, but will you please not hurt anyone else? You know, if that makes sense. Again, that's me. Well, Mason's about it. In, in a work environment, um, the Department of Labor has got um, guidelines uh, of non-disclosure uh, and disclosure. It's, it's, um, it's optional. But in an environment where uh, kindness, uh, uh, openness is encouraged, you find a lot of people succumbing to that uh, disclosure. So already it's fostered. So that person can feel, you know, like, oh yeah, this is a safe environment where you're encouraged not to disclose and the environment that doesn't allow you, it's not a safe space. So either way, you you, you can use your discretion as a person that has the condition uh, or in an environment where it's already forfeit, whether that is optional to you. That is what, uh, my answer. And, yeah, question. I was just thinking about the connections between what we've been talking about and the theme of this colloquium, going back to journalism, and the reinvention of journalism for different purposes. Um, my own experience of working with these sorts of issues with my students is that it is, um, there's, there's many pitfalls and many ethical difficulties when you ask students to start talking about um, things that they don't usually talk about. And they said, I mean, when when um, one shifts journalism away from the object, objective um, kind of communication of facts to people's um, social experiences of being excluded in different ways because of their identity issues, um, there's a kind of silencing that happens most of the time. And if you invite students into spaces where they are able to talk about those things, they often come there very fast. It's almost like there's a there's such a need for, for, for people to be able to talk about those things and, and about their own not fitting in in some way across many different social categories um, um, that they are very eager to do that um, when you open up a space for that. And I, I've got to, I mean, I've done that for many years, but I've got to a stage where I'm not sure that I know what I'm doing um, because um, People make themselves deeply vulnerable by talking about things that um, that they haven't necessarily processed for themselves already, and um, and that they're not necessarily completely aware of how they expose themselves when they put it in the public space. So whether you talk about um, aspect of gendered identity or disability, um, 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 I don't know whether one is necessarily able to hold that. And um, I see that as well in kind of traditions of, of personal storytelling in professional spaces in mainstream media, where often when young people, for example, or people from, who are vulnerable are asked to share aspects of the, of the personal like that about themselves, it has a, it has a potential to be exploitative. Um, and I'm not sure what the guidelines are for, for how one balances that. I suppose that's not so much a question, but a commentary. <laughs> Uh, the good thing of, I, I started from the convention, it's, it's a written document, it's a human rights document. And then every every country that ratified uh, that agreement, they say they'll put it in the constitution and embed it at every level. South Africa doesn't have a disability act, but it's working on the white paper uh, on disability inclusion. So there are guidelines, Department of Labor says with our, the Minister of Health, the guidelines uh, to the use of language, for instance, etiquette of disability. They are minors, they are there. I think what needs to be done is to just publicize them. You find that it's um, organizations like DPOs, uh, disabled people's uh, organizations, that sit, depending on their focus or mandate, whether it's autism, uh, or Down syndrome, they see so this this manual, and anybody they interact with, they'll give you the guidelines. They'll give you how to write, how how to use the correct language, how to interact, what's the right etiquette. So it's just like a, a guide on how to write. This 
things exist, the minors exist, but it's now the world, the way the, the attitude towards disability is. That's when it tends to lay. I'm not sure about the LGBTIQ. I know that it's a social, it's more of a social movement that needs, you know, need to be recognized. So I don't know if there's somebody who's actually written anything. But in the disability space, it's a bit difficult, uh, different because manuals are the HR component sits with a lot of this, how to interview, how to accommodate, what's reasonable accommodation is there. But as we said, policy is well and good, but if not applied, it doesn't do anything. Can I just respond to Jean there? I have a feeling, I might be wrong, but what you're describing is sometimes what happens in those safe spaces is the trauma that comes out from um, whether it's somebody who has a disability or is acknowledging, um, as you say, LGBTQI is not a disability, mm -hmm. but somebody might be acknowledging an identity for the first time that perhaps they've been persecuted for in the past, or there might be um, other wounds that have, have, have come up. So it's holding a safe space, not just for the discussion of the, the disability or the identity, but for the trauma that may have been incurred previously, that may have only just now come to life for the first time because the safe space has been provided. And so how do you hold a safe space for trauma, um, which may have arisen from this, without being trained in trauma-informed counselling. Um, I, I think that that does happen. That's why we're losing a lot of men to the depression. Mm -hmm. There's no spaces to talk about this. And it's been happening. Society is looking, wow, it died. And, and we can't do anything. There's not. Actually, I don't know if the response has been good enough because it's continuing to happen. And that's where the trauma part comes from. Yeah. And this was a spectrum, you know, depression, uh, mental health. It's also on the disability spectrum. And those are the things that people don't talk about because of ego, especially like you said, if you're over 50. A lot of men die because of uh, testicular cancer, you know, because they can't, it's, it's their ego. Ah, I can't be carried around. I can't be seen by my uh, daughter naked. You know, things like that, but which is detrimental to it. It's a condition for complex PTSD, which um, many, many, many people in this country have suffered from. And that's yeah. um, and I think one of the comments where you spoke, you spoke about schools having, you know, intervention problems, not just, I mean, programs, not just at university. I think also speaking to not just, you know, um, the gender and, um, but also the disability where students or learners are not aware. Thank you very much with that. I close this discussion.